Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In May 2019, one of the most energetic events in astronomy was observed. At the time, almost nobody noticed. There were only three instruments in the world which had the sensitivity to detect this, the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave telescopes. But after a year of analysing the signal, it's been concluded that the event released more energy in a second than our entire galaxy releases in a thousand years. And that's not even the most interesting part about this event. We'll get to that later. Now, as you know, the LIGO and Virgo telescopes use lasers reflecting off of mirrors a few kilometres apart to observe tiny changes in the length of space-time as gravitational waves pass through the Earth. It takes a phenomenal level of precision to do this, and there's a lot of filtering to remove random noise and check that the events are in fact real. For example, they actually have microphones on the sites to see if a signal that they're seeing is perhaps just a helicopter flying by. But when all three sites get a signal at the same time and every other explanation is eliminated, it's very likely a gravitational wave event. There have been several unambiguous detections of gravitational wave events since 2015. The first few were enough to win the Nobel Prize, but now we regularly get candidate events from this system, and we've gone from celebrating a single glorious event to starting to look at the statistics of gravitational wave events. The observed events mostly come from pairs of compact objects, either black holes or neutron stars, as they orbit towards each other. They generate gravitational waves during the orbits, and these waves carry away energy, and that means that the, the objects fall closer to each other and orbit faster, which in turn increases the energy lost to the gravitational waves. In the last few seconds before they merge, they're really close together and orbiting maybe hundreds of times per second, throwing out a massive chirp of gravitational wave energy as they merge into a single object. This event was called GW190521, that's 2019, May 21st, and it didn't look like the classic chirp event of a black hole merger. The frequencies were lower and the event was much shorter. Specifically, this event had a peak frequency of about 60 Hz, whereas the first gravitational wave event ever logged was 150 Hz. The lower frequencies were especially significant. A lot of the energy in a gravitational wave event is released in the final orbits as the two objects approach the speed of light in very close orbit around each other. And since the speed of light is the limit, as the objects get larger, the periods of the orbits have to get longer. So the low frequencies were a hint that this might be a very big event. So all the astronomers have to go on is a wobble in the signal. And, and the way they actually try to model what it is, is they basically build a model of a pair of black holes and spin them into each other and then they figure out what kind of signals those would generate. And they generate lots of different versions of this and try to find out which ones fit within the parameters. So this does inevitably lead to a fairly large range of results and you can see that in their paper, but they figure out that the most likely scenario is a pair of black holes, one massing 66 solar masses and the other massing 85 solar masses. And these descended down, spiraled into each other, released a huge amount of energy and produced a black hole of 142 solar masses. And the smart people out there will notice that 142 is less than 151, which is the mass of the black holes beforehand. What's the difference there? Well, the difference is that nine solar masses is the amount of energy that was released by this. And this is like a staggering amount of energy. Our sun is burning about 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second. And about 0.7% of that actually is converted into energy. So 4.3 million tons converted into energy produces the luminosity of the sun every second. Now, imagine instead you've got nine times our sun being converted entirely into energy. That's a huge amount of power, but here's the thing. It was all converted into gravitational energy, gravitational waves, and those spread out throughout the universe. And you, it's very hard to actually see them because they're not uh, things that our eyes are sensitive to. As well as being the most powerful black hole merger event ever observed, this is also the most distance. 5.3 gigaparsecs. This was, this event happened billions of years ago before the Earth was created and the energy is only now sweeping past the Earth and getting observed by these 
fantastic instruments. And another kind of fascinating thing about it is because these are so far away, this source is redshifted. And you know what? Redshift also has to apply to the gravitational waves. They're waves, and just like uh, light waves, the uh, wavelength is getting stretched out due to the target receding from the Earth. And you know, another fascinating thing they had to check for was the possibility of gravitational lensing. I and mean, we've seen this effect with Einstein crosses where you've got a bright source behind a galaxy and the galaxy bends and focuses the light around it. Well, they have to take account of this with gravitational waves. Think about that. Gravity can, in fact, lens gravitational waves. And that could make it look brighter and that might change their model, but they certainly looked at the data and didn't find any evidence of this. When you have um, gravitational lending, you typically have multiple signals arriving at slightly different times because they take different path lengths. But it's more than just the fact that this is the biggest event. This is actually the first event showing a new class of black hole. We, over time, we have logged various black hole candidates. There's the large black holes, the supermassive black holes in the middle of galaxies. These can be hundreds of thousands of solar masses. And then there are the stellar class black holes, which are maybe tens of solar masses. So this object with a mass of 142 solar masses is the first example of an intermediate mass black hole. And we weren't sure if those could actually exist in the universe. So black holes form when the matter is essentially collapsing under its own gravity. Now, if you take a cloud of gas and allow it to collapse under its own gravity, it doesn't form a black hole right away. It forms a star, and the star will start burning fuel, and that will stop it collapsing and start it making a lot of light. But eventually, it'll burn through the fuel, and some stars collapse down into a black hole while generating a supernova. Now, there's a minimum mass of black hole that can be produced by this, but there's also a maximum. In the middle of stars, as it gets hotter and denser, in the very largest and hottest stars, you start to get conditions where you can start producing matter-antimatter pairs. Uh, this is called pair production. You get positrons and electrons, and they don't flow through the core like gamma rays anymore. It changes the way that uh, energy can travel through the core, and actually it ultimately sort of serves to trap the energy in the core so that it heats up very quickly and blows the star apart. So the very largest stars don't actually produce black holes. They blow themselves apart entirely. And it seems like the cutoff is about 65 solar masses, which is actually very close to the mass of the lighter black hole in this particular merger. But the larger black hole was 85 solar masses. So where did it come from? I mean, I think the obvious solution is that this was part of a much more complex system in the past, and the, this has perhaps undergone multiple black hole merger events before we finally saw this one. It could be that these stars formed in a complex system in the middle of a globular cluster, which was a very dense star-rich region. And over time, there's been several mergers to produce this uh, larger one. There are other ideas. These could be leftovers from the Big Bang, primordial black holes that formed via a mechanism other than stellar collapse. It's hard to come to these conclusions based upon just one event, but you know, over time we're probably going to start seeing more and more as more telescopes come online and we'll start to do statistics. There is another side to this that was also reported that uh, this is a black hole black hole merger and almost all the energy comes out as gravitational waves, but the teams working with the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is a telescope that looks for short-term bursts of light in the sky, they claim to have found an optical flare in roughly the right place at roughly the right time, and they think that it might be related to this event. Their model has this black hole merger event happening near a supermassive black hole in an active galactic nuclei, and they think that the event was energetic enough to knock them through the accretion disk and generate a flare, and they predict uh, around December that we might see another flare from this. And that's great because it's something testable. In a few months, we can look at the AGN and see if there's an event. If there is, then we know that this black hole merger that was super energetic happened in an active galactic nuclei, which is very busy with stellar remnants and black holes. If it doesn't produce an event, then, well, we know that it didn't happen there. 
And that just means we know roughly how far away it was and roughly what direction, but we can't say specifically what galaxy it came from because we still don't have that level of precision with the gravitational wave t uh, events. When uh, we have a, an event which is much smaller, say with neutron stars, those do produce an optical flare and we can localize those with great accuracy. With the black holes, we don't get that. So again, this is one of the most energetic events ever observed. Nine solar masses of matter converted into energy. E equals mc squared equals a lot of energy. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.